morning, Lighthouse. Glad you guys are all here this morning. I think there's more in the lobby and they will slowly work their way in, but glad you guys are all here. I'm standing on our nice stage. It's all carpeted and everything. It's beautiful. So um, yeah, let me just open us up in a word of prayer. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day where we get to celebrate your birth. And I'm quickly reminded of how amazing your birth was, but what's even more amazing is that you came to die, to die for us. So Lord, as we celebrate Christmas, may we not lose that reality, that we can celebrate not just God coming in human form, but more importantly, that he gave his life so that we could stand righteous and perfect. Thank you, Lord. As we, as we have our service today, Lord, we take this time to give it to you. May it be all about you. May you be the central hope and purpose and word and reason why we gather today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that we have the opportunity to enter into your presence, to enjoy you, to find freedom in you, to be changed by you to be celebrated and danced over. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand?
with one another. The celebration that we have is all about Jesus. It's all about him this morning. If, you, if we celebrate him and we leave celebrating him, then it is indeed a good Christmas. Go ahead and have a seat, and I'd like to bring up um, Gloria and Heidi to light our Advent candle this morning. Go ahead and give them a hand as they come up. Yes. Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Today's theme is love. So I wanted to read 1 John 4, 9 through 10. It says this, God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so we see in Christmas, God's love displayed in flesh. And my prayer for us today is the prayer of Paul in Ephesians 3, when he prays for that revelation, because God gives us a greater revelation, right, by his spirit of his love. And so that is Ephesians 3. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm here for us. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you um, that you reveal that love among us. God, thank you that you give us greater revelation every day of who you are. Um, and that's our heart, Lord, is with expectancy um, to hear your voice today. God, to see you more clearly. We just thank you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. As we look at the candles, we see a candle for hope, peace, joy, and this morning's theme is love. The love of God brings them all together, doesn't it? Yeah. And um, we, 
We also want to give um, recognition and thanks to so many people who have been doing a lot to put um, well, everything together throughout the years uh, and the years. And I just want to acknowledge uh, those who have been working so hard to get our stage <laughs> ready. And uh, yes, <laughs> Scott has uh, initiated and headed up that project. And Jim was working so hard on the carpet. And also, Alan he was here all day yesterday doing so much. He's, he's still working somewhere right now outside. As it is right now, he's digging ditches and, you know, just uh, <laughs> running power lines and whatnot. The man just doesn't stop. And he always smiles, so want to recognize that. But all, we also, with that, with the improvements that we've had on our building and the ministry expansions that we've had, it's acknowledgement of what God's been doing around here and the gift that he gives us over and over and over of his constant provision. And so we're going to take our offering right now, but we, it's, it's an act of celebration and worship as well. When we take our offering around here, it's acknowledging that God is providing. He always has, and he's faithful, not just our material needs, but one another. And if you're here for the first time, this offering isn't for you. It, it's for those that call uh, Lighthouse home and for those that want to support what God is doing around here. So I'm going to pray for our offering. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come before you. We thank you. We praise you. We tell you that we love you. We know that all that we have is from your hand. All that we ever need comes from you. Every good thing is from you. We thank you for the many different ways that you've provided throughout the year, and especially the people through whom you've, begun, you've given provision, the relationships and the friendships you've given us. Thank you for making us family. We look back on a year of your goodness and your grace. We give this offering to you, Lord, as an act of worship with cheerful hearts, we ask that you bless it and multiply it to bring yourself glory and to bring your gospel truth and your love to the community and the region around us. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers are passing around the offering, but let's take a moment and recognize how much God has given us through one another. And it all started through the gift of God's son, the Lord Jesus on Christmas. And we're really going to get into, uh, into the meaning of that and letting the scriptures explain that. And so we're going to bring up uh, some, some awesome readers to read through some scripture of the Christmas uh, account. And if I could have Heaven, Janelle, and Jesse come on up, that would be great. Let's give them a hand. Come on. You can go up the stairs. Go, go and take the stairs up there. Come on up, you guys. It's okay to be shy. Pretend nobody is watching you, okay? So we're going to start off with uh, Janelle. Do you need me uh, or, or start off with heaven? What, want me to hold that for you? And in this same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the, the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to in the heaven on, uh, and on peace, peace among those, among those with, whom he is pleased. with whom he is pleased. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. <coughs> And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger, when they had seen him, they spread the word constantly, what been told them about the child, and all who heard it, it were amazed at what the shepherds 
said to them, but Mary treasured up to all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard, seen, which were just as they had been told. And to those words, we do say an amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We just thank you that you came and you became one of us and became incarnate word. And Lord, we thank you that you came in a way where it was to the simplicity, to a manger, to a place where it was announced to shepherds, and a place where it was announced in a way for each and every person to know the Savior is born. Let us chase away the preoccupations of this day and go back to those angels that made that announcement of the good news, to that place where all people were born a Savior. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Daniel Lara, in case you guys don't know him, you know him now. <laughs> Come on up, uh, Kim. Okay. Um, I just have a few announcements for you. The first one is, is if this is your first time at Lighthouse, we would love to formally welcome you. Thank you for joining us on Christmas Eve, and may you uh, be blessed as we worship the Lord together today. Um, there are communication cards that are in front of you. You can scan that with your phone camera if you want to know more about Lighthouse. 
But as I said last week, I'm going to say it again, the best way to get connected at Lighthouse is just to keep showing up. So we would love to see you again, second and third and 20th time. That would be great. So please come back. Um, just a few anno other announcements. Um, Women's Retreat, I talked about it in length last week. If you'd like to know more about it, women, you can come talk to me after the service. But um, I told you there wasn't really a deadline, but apparently there is. So if you are debating about going, if you could please sign up, that would be great so I can get a more formal head count. If you have not paid yet, we would love for you to, to kick in the corn as well. That would be amazing. And if that's going to be a struggle for you, then just please let us know. So, um, so thank you, women. The sign-up list is right around in the lobby. If you want to, again, if you want to know more about it, you can talk to me after the service. And then also, I seem to keep forgetting, but we do New Year's here at Lighthouse. Yes. And people keep asking me, are we not doing the New Year's party? I'm like, oh, we're doing the New Year's party. I just keep forgetting to, to announce it. So it's now officially announced. On Sunday night, this next week, after you get through all of the Christmas hustle and bustle, we got to go right into New Year's, people. So it's, uh, it's from 6 to 9 here at the church. Um, we, at 9 o'clock, we, uh, we do an East Coast New Year's. So we'll welcome in 2024 at 9 o'clock, and then you can go home and go to bed. That's the best part. So um, it is very family friendly, and it is, if you've never been, it is really low key, unless the weather makes it high key. But um, I was just noticing that I think we've done this for like six years, and two out of the six years we have lost power thanks to storms. So it always makes for a very exciting time. So you come, you bring a snack, you bring a game, we do karaoke, it is very low key, the kids are running around, it's just fun. So if you have nothing to do on New Year's, I would encourage you to come out for that. And um, I believe that I had one more, but you know me, I forgot it when I got up here. So read your bulletin, it has all of the information that I forgot to tell you about. So children, you are excused to your class, and if everybody else, we're just going to do like 90 seconds of just greeting people, and then um, if you don't feel like greeting, you can sit there, and then Resendo will come back in a few minutes. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody, and Merry Almost Christmas. It is... Uh, who here celebrates Christmas? Has, you have Christmas dinner and relatives over and you do all that stuff on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, people. Who here? No, it's not Christmas until it's Christmas and you do all your stuff on Christmas Day. Who here thinks there's no reason why not to do both? Right. Christmas Eve and my wife and I um, came to a recent revelation. I think it was late last night when we realized that we weren't done with a lot of our stuff and... This is what we realized, that um, we could go beyond Christmas, okay? <laughs> we could still wrap some presents and do some delivering and Christmas stuff even after Christmas. In fact, you may not have known this, but I'm going to tell you something maybe new, that the Christmas story is actually there all year round, okay? And, and these Christmas songs are actually uh, songs that we could sing all year round, but we make, uh, make it more of a holiday thing, don't we? Well, this morning, we want to look at what Christmas is all about and, and what Christmas means so that our celebration will be truly focused in the right direction so that not, no matter what happens from this point on, dynamics and family, gifts that you didn't ask for, or whatever that might be, that won't be uh, the source of your joy, peace, hope, and what is the gift of Christmas. We're, our theme this year is the gift. And who is Jesus? And so that's why we have presents wrapped up. And when we look at these presents or any type of a present wrapped, we might think, yay, there's something good. There's something good for me, maybe. What is it that you think about when you see a present and it has your name on it? What do you think about when you see a present and it has your name on it? What comes to mind? Is it, I hope they didn't get me something I don't want? Or is it, how did they know it's just what I want? Or is it, does, is it appreciation for the, the giver of the gift? Is it appreciation for how it's wrapped? What is it about a gift that makes you go, oh, something good? When we look at these gifts, they're just symbolic and they're, they're for atmosphere. But they remind us that Christmas turns our attention to a gift that is given a gift that has been given with your name on it, with my name on it. 
And it's a gift that must be opened up and received. This gift is God himself with us. It, this gift is actually him saying, I want to live with you and I want you to live with me. And I've done all that it's needed for that to happen. It's a gift that you didn't expect in a sense. See, in this world, when we think about gifts, when we think about God and faith, sometimes we think about what we need to do, almost as if we're wrapping our own gift. But Christmas reminds us that God has done it all. He loves us that much. So when you see the, the tree in the morning, wherever you put gifts or whatever draws your attention in the morning, I hope that what will draw your attention even more is what God has already done, what he has already planned for, what he has already executed, what is already yours and mine. Let's look into that. First of all, did Christmas happen the way we think it does? In Luke chapter one, we read, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first were, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most ex excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. So here is Luke writing, and he was, he's, there's so much commentary that has been given about Luke, this author, even secular um, um, writers and, and historians say that Luke was a historian of, um, of the highest nature. He, he, what he wrote about, archaeologists find. What he wrote about, people find over and over from the book of Acts to the book of Luke. And so we have him here saying that I've done a lot of research. I've interviewed all the people. I've gathered it all together, and I've written it down for, for you. We also have many different prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus' birth. By his birth, the way he was born, where he was born, uh, there's just a handful. I won't go over all of them this morning, but there's these and so many more. So the, what was written about Jesus is well um, researched. And just the fact that he was born and the way he was born says that God planned something out a long time ago. It, there's something very meaningful. And we read this you know, from, from Luke as well. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Canarius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So there's something happening at a specific time in, his, in history to a specific people, specific purpose for, and this was written for specific readers. Something happened. Something actually happened and it was wonderful and glorious. We have an insight into what that is and we call it Christmas. Jesus was born, but before he was born, the angels spoke to both Joseph and to Mary to announce what would happen. And they had to respond with a yes, let it be so, let it happen. And then they went on this long walk. Look at this journey that they took here. Through some mountainous terrains, winding in and out, two possible routes there. And from Jericho to Jerusalem is a very high climb. And then back down to Bethlehem. So it wasn't like this gift, like, oh, yay, I got a new toy. What a great God. It's like, no, you have the gift of me with you, an incredible purpose in your life. And it looks a lot like walking a long distance. It looks a lot like something that you didn't expect, but it is good. And and I believe that that's part of the message this morning, the part of what I, I think God wants to draw our, our attention to. And that is that how he gives, the way he gives, through whom he gives is very, very good. But if we're always looking for his gifts, his goodness, his very heart and presence with us to be wrapped up in something shiny and something more comfortable, more interesting, more enticing, then we'll miss it. But what he gives to us is good planned out by himself and given. Sure, that was a tough walk and a tough journey. I wonder if there's some tensions along the way, like families sometimes have on the way to church. I wonder if there's some arguments and they keep on going back to, yeah, but God told us this is what he wants us to do. Or, oh yeah, this is a blessing. That's right. But they get to Jerusalem. And once they get to Jerusalem, 
There is no room for them in any of the hotels or the inns. There is no space to reserve. So they went and they spent the night or they stayed in a manger. And this is what is likely um, what a manger looked like. It's the bottom floor of the garage of, um, of buildings. It could also be a, a cave. It could also be a dwelling out in a field. But uh, what they would call the place where they put the animals, the stables, if you will, for travelers, that's what they would call a manger. And what was available uh, for them for the birth of Jesus is an actual trough that they called a manger as well. We see pictures of wooden, a wooden um, trough or, or manger, but archaeologists say it's likely this, and so they filled that up. And this was the gift of God to us. Reading through Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is con conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. We saw the part of the greatest gift right there. Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. When we think of a gift, sometimes we think, I want to raise. I want something that I think is better for me. But the gift of God is both what we truly want and also what we, what we desperately need. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he, had not, he did not consummate their marriage until they gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The name Jesus, which means saves his people. Savior, the gift of Jesus, this baby in, in that manger, is actual salvation, the gift of salvation, a rescue from a dark world. If you could just let your, let your hearts and your minds be led by the Spirit to imagine what God has, has done, what he did on this glorious, incredible night that was Christmas where there was darkness in the world, where there was violence and hardship, political strife, a lot like today, a baby was born. God making himself as approachable as, as we could ever imagine. But this gift is a rescue. This gift is paid in full rescue. It's not just uh, an occasion for a holiday, right? We get our lives back. That's the gift. I can't explain that to you. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Whatever you're hearing this morning, this is the gift. We get our lives back. And we get to spread that to everybody around us. Jesus is that we get to have life again. In John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. You see, John, when he describes the birth of Jesus, he's thinking deep. I want to tell you who it was that came into the world. And he says here, the word, the logos, the thoughts of God, the essence of his, of his thinking, the ex full expression of his creativity of who he is, was there in Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came into the world as a light. What is light? It, it enables us to see. And it enables us to walk more freely. And it enables us to see one another. You see, without Jesus coming into the world, we see each other in defensive ways. People are the problem, not the blessing, right? But with Jesus, people become the blessing and those that we are to bless. And there's great joy in that. And there's peace in that. And there's 
hope in that. But it's more than that. God's very essence, who he is, the way he thinks, the way he is, what he is actually like, comes into the world. God is mighty. He is almighty. At, at a word, the universe started leaping into existence. At a word, it could be shut down. God is like the sun. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It warms us up. It sustains life. It gives life. But if we get just a little too close, even a hair closer than we ought, we can get burned up. He is mighty. He's in, 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 incredible. And yet, he approaches us as an infant. That says something about him. That though he is mighty, he wants us. And we could have him. But we don't know how to hear him. Not on our own. Not the world can't hear God or even understand him on their own because we're stuck in a posture, a disposition of confusion or misunderstanding or accusation. God, how could a good God let all this stuff happen? How? God, did my life have to be the way it is? We have a cat. I know I've shared this story before. I plan to share it 100 times, so I'm on 50 right now. We have a cat named Gwynnie. She's a wonderful cat, and um, she needs uh, flea medicine every now and then, and every now and then she'll even need a shot. And it's for her good. We just want what's best for her. If we don't give her these treatments, her life won't be that good. She'll be miserable, and so will the rest of us. Um, <laughs> consequently, now, to give her this medicine, we have to capture her. We can't just say, hey, come. She won't come. I, I, I have read that, um, that cats are able to obey and understand over 250 commands. They just choose not to. They just <laughs> say no to every single one of them. <laughs> they just throw that right back at us. So here's Gwynny, and here's us saying, we love you. We want to take care of you. We want you to live a very long life. And here's her losing her fur everywhere, accusing us of attacking her, running away from those who have always fed her, those who have always pet her when she demanded it, those who have tolerated her waking us up in the middle of the night for no reason at all. There she is now accusing us of being the enemies. And so what, what do we have to do? We have to get a towel, wrap her up, give her the treatment, and then all is better and she has no idea the good that we did for her because she just can't understand. She's a cat. And I remember, here's a story. I remember so clearly, uh, I, I was just a year into this because I married into a cat, didn't choose it for myself. But, and I was on my own trying to do this. Robin wasn't around. And I was trying to have this conversation with this cat, won't pay attention to me at all. And I'm looking at this cat running all around thinking that I traumatized her by giving her treatment, by loving her, caring for her. Um, and I'm looking at her, I'm like, there's zero chance of you ever thinking that I did something good for you. The only way that you could possibly ever understand is if I become a cat. If I become a cat and then I speak cat to you. But even then, because of your cat disposition, you'll still accuse me. <laughs> you'll still not think uh, the best of me. But I, but I had that thought, that actual thought. And as soon as I had that thought, it hit me. Oh, that's what Jesus did. On our own, we have this disposition even after having put our faith in Jesus, we have the propensity to drift to that part of us that doesn't speak God's language, that doesn't understand him, that doesn't choose him, that doesn't give him credit for everything that is good, but accuses him for everything that is bad. But in the midst of all that, all of the world's rejection, outright rejection, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of the confusion and accusation and even the condemning of God and choosing other gods that we make up, in the midst of all of that, in response, I should say, to all of that, what does the perfect, loving, good God do? He comes to us to be one of us, to demonstrate for us, to live the ways that we can't, to make the decisions that we keep on saying we'll do one day. And he lives a perfect life to return us to his language. What is his language? It's, it's, his language is love. We don't understand that. We're so suspicious of anybody who seems to be looking like they appearing to love us. But he blows that away and he comes to us and says, 
I do love you. Isaiah 9.2 reads, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. This light is in Jesus and shines to us, in us, and through us when we receive it by faith. And after faith, after faith, that light shining in us shines to one another, for one another. And so the gifts that we see around us, we realize, God, you had given me so many people, so many wonderful people that have helped me, have been good to me. I want to bring up uh, Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind, Cheryl, come on up. Uh, I, I want to ask Cheryl to share a little bit of what um, uh, an experience that she had somewhat recently that demonstrates this. And uh, can you guys give a hand to Cheryl? Yeah, Cheryl White. And I, I'll come down there with you, too. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> And Cheryl, I, I know that yeah, I think you already have in mind what you're going to say, but just to, to set it up, you had a, a, a circumstance where you could have walked away from an interaction. That you know, It's one of those things that we all have where we think, oh, could I have said something to that person? Or maybe was it just me or was it God telling me? And all these moments that we often go through that we walk right past, but they're moments that God brought up for the purpose of shining his light. And so can you share a little bit about that, your story? Yeah. I don't normally walk up to strangers and ask them if I can pray for them. It's just something I thought, I'm, to be a witness, other people witness. But God wants all of us to witness. So I felt when I went out um, just two days ago and went shopping, I felt like there was somebody I was supposed to pray for during the course of that day. And so I was expecting something and looking around at people, the homeless person that didn't feel right. Mm. And God said, I'm going to make it easy for you. So this lady behind me was on the phone, and she was in tears. And I thought, that's the one. Okay. <laughs> that was easy. So when she walked out, I just said, can I pray for you? And it was just so easy. And someone had told me that just recently. You know, if you just go to someone and just say, can I pray for you? It's just a good way to open up a conversation. Mm -hmm. turned out that she had just so many things in her life going on. Her son was alcoholic, one had a stroke, she was taking care of him, 92-year-old wow. mom going to her house twice a day, yeah. and she had broken her hip and was in a chair thing, wow. and she was so overcome that I would just stop and pray for her, and we just talked for a little bit, and um, I got to pray for those things in her life, and I walked away so excited. Mm. It blessed me as much as it did her, right? because now yeah. I want to go do it again. Right, oh. So I was so excited, again. I thought, I want to share something with you, and I, I had these socks, I said, I bought four pair, the two, two pair to a thing, pick a color. And she didn't want to do it, and I tore it apart and handed her pair and said, uh, when you put them on tonight, know that God loves you, he sees you, and I'm praying for you. And I got home that night, and I took out my other pair of socks, and what I thought was a pair of socks, that was one pair of socks, and I gave her one sock. Oh. <laughs> I have the other one. So now I think about her all the time because of this. Mm. I'm going to put this by my bed, and she yeah. asked for my name and was going to pray for me. And I think I'll be praying for her even a lot more than I would have. Yeah. And they're wonderful. They're real furry. <laughs> <laughs> they're great. But anyway, it's somebody out there, maybe somebody that knows her, that knows she's discouraged but isn't here, yeah. is praying for her that God will bring someone along. Yeah. And you might be the answer to that prayer. I know you yeah. guys have people you're praying for, but you just want someone to come and talk to them. Yeah. So we could be the answer to that prayer and be praying for them. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And, and so we, we think of what God has done for us, but something that we need to point out and really look at during Christmas and throughout the year, but when we're thinking about gifts, the gifts that we also are given is that, that Jesus would come into us, into our life, into our heart, and give us purpose to then shine for everyone else. And we, and we might say, I, I don't have anything for anybody. Look, I have nothing. I'm the person who needs something. And God, I don't, and maybe you've had these experiences where you have nothing to give and you're the one asking and God puts somebody in front of you that has a need and you know for sure you're the one who's supposed to try to help them. That's a gift. Joy comes out of that. When we let the love, the real love, the real peace, and the hope, and the very heart of God come through us to somebody else, light shines in a dark place. That place that was dark in you 
the light of Jesus starts to shine. The, the place that you see that is dark, that you think might be even too overwhelming for you to address, just walking one step toward that, light starts to shine. We do live in a dark world, but as we read, Jesus is the light of the world and the darkness has not overcome it. He's light. Darkness isn't anything. It's just the absence of Jesus. Matthew 1, 21 through 23. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us in many different ways. He's with us through the person of the Holy Spirit, God, God himself in us. He's with us through his, what he calls his body, the body of Christ, all of us together connecting. He's with us in ways that we don't even expect. Christmas is so meaningful when we get out of the pageantry of it and we realize that Jesus came to light every dark place. I was with a, a boy one time, he was 14 years old, and I was his case manager. He was receiving foster care services. And um, his, his life was very difficult, no fault of his own whatsoever. And his parents tried as hard as they could, but they had some hangups and habits they just couldn't get over. But within that family system, he received a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. And within uh, the school system that he was attending was his current placement, foster care. It was in foster care. He received a lot of abuse from other kids. Kids can be so mean, such bullies. And then, and then we all grow up and learn how to be bullies online. <laughs> but there, I was with him uh, uh, during uh, an appointment with his psychiatrist, because that's how behaviors are managed. So he was there with the psychiatrist they had seen a few times, and I was there as his case worker just to, to be there occasionally as part of my job, to, to be there and to be a support. And with the psychiatrist, I had no indication or no, any reason to believe that he was a Christian, a man of faith in any which way. And I didn't know that the, that the boy, 14-year-old boy, had any questions about God whatsoever. But right, right in the middle of the interview, and the, the psychiatrist is interviewing him about his behaviors, his day, how he's feeling, this and that, how our current medication's working and such. In the midst of that, the 14-year-old says, why has all this happened to me? Almost, he just kind of looked up and said, I don't know who to even ask this question of. Um, I think maybe you. Why did all this happen to me? It doesn't seem fair, and he's getting agitated. And then he says this, why hasn't God answered my prayers? Why, when I called out to God, why hasn't he done anything? Why? And my heart was just breaking for him. I wanted to break all the rules right then and there and say, God is alive, he's right here. He's right here right now. But also with a, but also with a nervousness, because that, at that point, I didn't know how to answer that. Evidence-wise, so much scripture I could quote. What does that mean to somebody who's lived a life as hard as him? But the psychiatrist, again, without seeming more or extra spiritual, replies to him. He takes in a breath and he goes, okay. Well, that's an interesting thought. So you've prayed to God and asked God to change things and change your life and to, and to protect you and to save you. And the kid's like, yeah. And the psychiatrist looks around and looks at his file. And he's like, well, it looks like you're no longer living in the home that was hurting you. It looks like the people that were hurting you the most um, got in trouble and they're not going to be able to hurt anybody else again. It looks like the home that you're in right now, you've been telling me that it's a really nice home and you feel comfortable there and they seem to care about you. And he looks at me, he's like, this, um, your caseworker here seems to really care about you too and he's, it's his job to make sure that you're safe and your life is good. And, and it looks like you're still with your brother and your big brother is caring for you too. He says, wow, it, it sounds to me like maybe God did hear you and he has heard you. And that settled him. He didn't become joyful and happy right then and there. He's 14 years old. <laughs> but he's like, he just responded with this. Oh, like a 14 year old would. <laughs> oh, but I'm like in tears. I'm like, yeah. 
You see, many of us have cried out to God and say, why? Why am I still hurting? Why is the world still the way it is? Mary and Joseph were probably thinking, why does Bethlehem have to be so far? Why can't there be a place? God, if this is your plan, this is your plan, you could do anything. It seems as if you have taken full control of the whole universe, all of astronomy, everything to make today happen, but we couldn't get a room to stay in? Why, God, why? Why did this happen to, have to happen to Mary this way so that everybody looked at her and is suspicious of wrongdoing? Why this way? And yet, they see a new community forming around them of shepherds, of people that normally wouldn't be seen. They are experiencing something about God that they wouldn't have seen any other way. And the same thing with you and I. God has heard your cry. He has seen your heart. We're here together, aren't we? We're here together right now, aren't we? We're sharing faith. We're hoping together. And we're, we're rescuing and building each other up through the strength and the heart that he gives us. Christmas is not just a pageant. It's not just a present. It's the God of all creation, the God of all hope, the God of peace, the God of love saying, I'm here to be with you. Not the way you expect, but I'm right here. Let's look at our lives. We're alive. Many of us can say, man, our lives could have gone so many different ways, but we're here. What a gift. What a gift. And each and every one of us has the power, the ability, and the very heart of God in us by faith to light up somebody else's life. There's a lot of questions that are probably not going to be answered but there's a lot of life to understand in Christ. Christmas is this, the gift that we have always wanted and needed. God with us. It is proof that God has a desire for us to be with him. It is proof that God has a plan for us to be with him. Now, if God has a desire for us to be with him, He's a mighty God. He'll make that happen, but he won't force it upon us. He went the full distance to get to us so that we could say yes. God has a plan. There's great hope in that. If God has a plan, we have hope. We have hope. What we see isn't the end of the story. It's not the full story. There's something great happening. In fact, Christmas was just the beginning. Just the beginning. He's coming back. And in the meantime, he's with us and in us and all around us. Christmas is proof that God has new li a new life to live for us to live with him. Proof that God has a new life for us to live with him. We're not stuck. I'm looking forward to the series that's coming ahead. Our next series starting in January is called Unstuck, a study through the book of 2 Peter. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to get unstuck in our faith. And to realize not only do we have hope for hope's sake, but God has a plan for us, a new life for us to live out with him. The gift of Jesus is offered to us without any cost. He is our free gift of new life. Putting that all together and understanding how God gives good gifts, the gift of Jesus. Maybe we're reminded, encouraged once again to pray to come to him, to cry out to him over and over and over and over again. That every single one of us has something to give and has been given something. I remember the first person who demonstrated to me what it means to pray over and over and over. It was my mom. She didn't have anything. She didn't have money. She didn't have an education. She didn't go to seminary. But no, you know what she had? A relationship with Jesus. And she prayed for me over and over and over and over and over again until I came to faith. And a lot of that prayer of hers looked like rejection of her, but she prayed over and over and over again. Somebody has been praying for you over and over again. Jesus says that he lives to intercede for us. Mm. He is good. 
All right. When the angels, Luke chapter 2, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and, and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what, wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it has been told to them. What we have here is a celebration of all that we have seen God do, of what we are realizing that he has done. He has done it all. He has come to us. He's done it all for us to come to, to him. This morning, I want to challenge us to Receive the gift of Christmas. Receive Jesus. Many of you would say that you already have, that you have already received him by faith. But I want to challenge us this Christmas to let the joy of the Lord really explode in us by focusing on Jesus and Jesus only. I'm not saying God in general. I'm not even saying I want you to leave here with God. I want you to leave here with Jesus, with Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that is eternal God, the savior of our soul, the one who died so that we wouldn't have to, the one who was born into the world. This is who Jesus is. He was born into this world through a virgin birth, so his life was perfect, and he lived out a perfect life. Every decision that we couldn't make, he made. Every act of obedience that we wish we would do, he did. He lived the perfect life, and in his righteous soul, probably tortured by seeing the darkness around him. And for the joy set before him, he got up on the cross, having lived a perfect life, having already experienced accusation, condemnation, and attack on him over and over, entered into the world that rejected him and as a person re being rejected, gets up on the cross and dies for us by letting all of sin of humanity be placed on him so that all of our sins will die with him on the cross. But because he is mighty God, by the power of God, he was raised again on the third day and now his perfect life continues on so that we, by faith, can say, I will receive what you have done for me. My sins by faith on the cross with you will die. And by faith, I give you my heart so that I live through your resurrected life. That's the Jesus I'm presenting this morning. That's the gift that we're talking about here. The gift of Jesus and Jesus alone. There is nowhere else to go. There is no one else to worship. There is no one else who loves you. There is no one else through, through no one else who you can get the love of God from. There is no one else who you can come to and say, I know I've made some mistakes. I know I've made a mess of my life, but in you, it's all settled. There's nowhere else to go. There's no temple. There's no great cathedral. There's no great person. There's no amount of reading. There's no amount of, of, of serving and good works we can do. There's none of that. There is only Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm stressing this over and over and over because if this was to be my last sermon, it would be this. Jesus loves you. He's our, he's our rescuer. He's the greatest gift we'll ever have. Just say yes. Perhaps you need to say yes for the first time in a long time. Pray with me this morning. And at coming out of this prayer, I want to lead us in a, in, in a, uh, in a carol. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. We thank you for the gift of who you are, the gift of coming to us that we would join you forever. And with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you need to say yes to Jesus this morning to receive this gift by belief, please pray with me. If this is your decision to receive Jesus this morning, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe that on the cross, you paid the penalty for all of my sins. And I choose this morning to live my life with you and for you. I receive you into my life this morning. I receive the precious gift that is you by your grace and with your help. If that's been your prayer, can you raise your hand that I could pray for you? Praise God, yes. Amen, yes. Lord, for these hands that are raised and these hearts that you see, will you flood us with your love this morning and get us on our first steps towards you? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with that heart 
and not focus on Jesus right now. Sing these songs. Sing this next song. Just a, we're going to just run through it a few times without any music at all. Come let us adore him. Can we get that, those slides up? And, and please, uh, I'm going to start us off, but you don't want me to, to hold it for you. You guys got to. <laughs> oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exultation, sing all ye sing. Would you stand? indeed. We still have one more service, our candlelight service tonight at 5 p.m. It is going to be different, some different elements, so feel free to come, even if you've already come to this one, and invite as many people as possible. We hope to see you there tonight at 5 o'clock for our candlelight service. <laughs>